Let's get this out over here. Nope, now we're talking. Welcome to Varm Blog, and today I'm talking with Nico uh, Villarreal, and we are talking about Altusser and how much he sucks. Our, um, uh, Nico is going to contest that challenge. Um, Nico has heard my story about how uh, I was asked to teach Altusser um, about 14 years ago as an example of Marxism, and I um, doubled down and became even more of a reactionary. And um, um, I actually, however, caricature aside, I think one does have to deal with um, the Altusserian development of what would could, both in like the terms of French structuralism and in terms of science of logic and inevitability concerns. Um, that's kind of big and broad and vague. And uh, I have always kind of seen that there's a loose, you know, from Russell Jacobi's dialectic of defeat, that Marxism had two sides. It actually goes back to Hegelianism. One side is the phenomenological, soft, squishy, quasi-humanistic side. And the other side is the science of logic. Uh, inevitableist Marxism is a hard science side. Autusser, I think, um, a lot of people read him as reacting to things like the Frankfurt School and critical theory, which I think is hilarious because he wasn't, like, at all. Um, there's very little reference to the German, like, to the Germans in America and stuff in Adornian theory. What he seems to actually be reacting to um, when I read his biography, is French Hegelianism, like Kojebe, more than, say, uh, uh, I don't know, Adorno or something, uh, or Korsh or something like that. And he also seems to be reacting to the trajectory of the of the French Communist Party, particularly after the Kujevian reform, the Khrushchevian reforms. Khrushchev did shit, and, <laughs> um, and it made Autusser sad. Um, but but not so much in Russia as it seemed to the effect that it had in France. And when I read someone like Baudrillard's engagement, like in the late 70s, early 80s, you can kind of see what Althusser was actually concerned with being somewhat legitimate, that it was that it was more and more developmentalist, concessionalist, and justifying it in some namby-pamby like humanism that even by humanist standards, like when we talk about like Marxist humanism of the of the um, more structured, like Karl Korsch variety uh, that um, that's not really what Althusser was concerned with, and that's hence why he doesn't reference it even to critique it very often, except in the French case. Um, but there's also all these other theories of ideology and science. Um, Althusserians disagree about what he actually meant. I mean, you read Ranciere and Balabar on this stuff, and you know you feel like you're seeing different sides of Althusser fight himself after he's uh, gone. You know, I'm also gonna push Nico on the idea that I think the actual heir to Althusser is a dirty, not Marxist like Foucault. Um, which I can already see makes. Yeah, I, 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 I'll have to push back on that one. Uh, <laughs> pretty strong. Well, I I can see it in certain ways that uh, like you want to talk about um, like the episteme a, as like the successor yeah. to what Althusser meant by I ideology more than like like you know Foucault's dirty anti-Marxism. Actually, that in of itself is just a contested crime. Like Foucault wasn't a Marxist yet, like. The, theoretically, but he was actually more loyal to Marxist parties than a lot of the Marxists were. Um, Not more loyal than Althusser, though. Uh, yeah, well. I, I will say that um, I, I think that the key thing that Althusser preserves that Foucault doesn't is that Althusser preserves like a teleology of in Marxism. Uh, he, and Foucault and the rest of the post-structuralists kind of get away from that. It, I mean, I think you can read certain passages of Deleuze that kind of, that you could argue, that you could use to argue a teleology. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I I think that's the most important part uh, that Althusser preserves. 
and he does it. And I don't think, and you've uh, attacked him in the past, I think, for uh, being overly deterministic uh, or at, or just being deterministic is we're going to get, I think we'll have to get into over-determinism in a little bit. Um, yeah, because I also have accused him of misusing that word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he he I, he did pioneer it using it in this context. I was about to say he pioneered using it in this context, which is the dirty French tactic of misappropriating terms. So, like, to be a vulgar reductionist when it comes to European critical theory, I'm usually like France boo. Um. <laughs> well, usually I would agree with you, but I make an exception. Well, I make two two exceptions. I make an exception for Al Jazeera. I'll make an exception, kind of for Deleuze. Um, oh dear God, man. <laughs> uh, okay, like like you just hit you hit the like you hit enemy number two and said I want to make an exception <laughs> for enemy number one. Like, <laughs> um, so. But I actually find Al Jazeera fascinating. And one of the things I can can say a little bit about this to like to take it out of this like parody thing that, I, that we're doing here. Um, and then to kind of put some liberty into what could be a really over the head of a lot of people conversation. I think Altusir to me is illustrative of a lot of problems that emerge specifically in a lot of different, I almost want to say post Marxisms, but that, that implies that they don't see themselves as Marxist anymore. And I don't want to, I don't entirely want to imply that but there there is like post second international basically yeah yeah basically like there's a crisis in the second international that crisis is because in my mind all the various schools and i don't just mean the second international i also mean those who abstain from it have predictions about what would happen objectively they're all wrong <laughs> like like everybody everybody makes like everybody, like whether or not you agree with their theory, everybody makes predictions that leave something out. This to me causes a crisis, particularly for those in the Soviet Union that had the, I mean, outside of the Soviet Union, excuse me, those in the Soviet Union didn't have the, the privilege of having the crisis because they might get liquidated for their lack of faith. Um, and so the crisis is really in the areas where communism is more distant. Right. So like this leads to, I think, uh, a resurgence and really blurring of the lines in left communism. Um, it leads to these the left oppositionist tendencies becoming more and more influential, in, particularly in the Anglo sphere, but also in Latin America. And when I and when people go left oppositionist versus left communism, they're very different um, left oppositionist is about the Soviet Union. It's really mainly, are you a Trotskyist or not? Um, uh, it led to the development of right oppositionism, which that's all you are, Bakarinite or not. And, and, um, and then the left communism, which had deviated earlier, you have your two deviations in Leninist and non-Leninist forms. I go through this because they all have a crisis around this time. Like around the 50s is when things, like really go all kinds of haywire, right? And what's interesting is in France, more than any other country, for reasons that I don't entirely understand, all those tendencies, including the new hip white people playing at Maoism one, um, all emerge at once. Like they're, they're all represented. So, so like you have variants of Italian, of Italian left communism in France. You have a variance of Italian of, you know, of like Dutch Council communism in France. You have um, overlaps with the developments of American and British Marxist humanism. You have Trotskyism in France, although it never is dominant in the way it is in the Anglosphere. You have you have fucking Badu, who's like weird left Platonism from space. I don't know. Like um, you have everything represented in a way that comes into head with a party that seems like it could actually do something. And yet historically, well, we know what went down. I mean, like it, it all, it can't figure out where to pivot, like it, to Euro communism, to the doubling down on a Bolshevik, on the Bolshevik line of the, you know, of the post third international USSR 
of running over the Maoism and flirting with the Cultural Revolution without even knowing what it is. Like, um, of these new forms of, like, po truly post-Marxism that emerge. Um, and you also have the fact that the French, the French also inject, frankly, these, I'm going to say proto-scientific to be nice, um, proto-scientific philosophies of language and their own somewhat deviant strains of psychoanalysis get injected in this on steroids in France. And I'll just say specifically in this context, and trying to ca carve out something there. And if you look at, like, for example, a book that you and I both agree people should not start with, um, Reading Capital, particularly the big one with all the chapters by everybody in it, you can find representatives of, uh, even from Althusser's milieu, emerging out of that. So you have, like, something like Left Communism emerging out of Ranciere. You have, um, I think I pronounced that right. Also, people who speak French. Everything will be pronounced wrong. Just Including accept that. Me. Yes. It, just accept that and you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> you can correct me and I will pretend to take your advice out of respect and I will screw it up. Ask me how to say the name Jills Duvet or Dov or Dive or whatever. Duve. Um, I've, there's an episode of, uh, I believe it's, either a late episode of Diet Soap or early episode of Inside Zero Books where I literally pronounced that name five different ways in the same podcast because I was just seeing which one would stick. Um, I so, think I just say Dov. Or yeah, Dov. Dov. Yeah. So, whatever. And I know you hate him, so we're not going to talk yes. about that. <laughs> so, I, like, Very much. I look forward to your uh, critique at some point of endnotes with the, that other guy. Uh, uh, with Esri? Uh, yeah. Over at, uh, at, Pop, at Pop the Left. It and for, I mean, not pop the left. Uh, <laughs> mortal science. Mortal science. For those of you who who know normal Varn blogs where we just talk, and who know um, my work at Mortal Science, and who know my work at Pop the Left, this is going to be between a Pop the Left episode and a Mortal Science episode, and my assumed prior knowledge. Right. So I assume you know something about this. About Nico, I know you know something about this because you've been like Varn, you're being unfair to to the Paris Strangler. Um, uh, to Althusser, yes, yeah. I, I, well, I I think that uh, well, the one book that you haven't read, the uh, Philosophy of Encounter, is probably mm -hmm. I am limited by what I have read, but in my opinion, it's the best piece of post-war theory that we have. Um, I think it's brilliant, and I and there are moments in Althus there, and the reason why I love him so much, and I'll re actually stop reading him to go, wow, that's brilliant. And I don't have that moment very often with a lot of other people. Um, okay, so let's first go. Let's first go off with like a critical reception of Althus there. Yes. Why is the shitty Althus there taught first? Like, why do you give me Lenin and philosophy to go teach it to undergrads before you've even taught them Marxism? Um, and what? like, I'm going to talk about ideological structural apparatuses decontextualized as if it makes sense. So I think, no, I think that's, that's that not about? a bad idea. Um, I, I really like that essay. The uh, it's how I started with Alex Cesare. Um and I think that it's like it's al almost the basis of uh, everything that I uh, like all the theory that I do. Uh, um, I mean, how like. But this may be because I do not have the background that you have that knows all the tricks of the, the Hegelian uh, mark. Like, you, you know, Lukash. I don't know Lukash. So I probably use Althusser for a lot of the things you use uh, Lukash for. Well, you think it's, I hate Lukash, but, you know, <laughs> like, like, see, when people think I'm like I'm picking I'm picking sides between the Hegel Marx and uh, and the structural Marxist debate, I think. I think um, the problems that Lukash introduces in this crisis period, which, you know, it's from the, him's coming out of the 20s. And what Lukash tries to do is say, OK, OK, guys, maybe the prediction. I mean, this is an this is a very unfair summary, but the whole Marxism is a methodology as opposed to any canon of things we have to hold on to seems to emerge out of this crisis. 
that uh, that Lukash is seeing coming before everyone else does. Actually, he's seeing it coming in the twenties. Um, and what he says initially is something. It's almost what he criticizes himself for in, in, in uh, Tailism and the long title that I'm not going to remember off the top of my head. There's this um, where, but he does basically say whatever the proletariat organ believes, and by this we mean the the Soviets at the time, and by the Soviets I mean literally the councils. Um, in conjunction with the party, must be methodologically the conclusions of Marxism. Because Marxist method would lead you to believe that way. Now, you and I both know that if that's true, just from a strict, like, not from a Marxist standpoint, but from a strict, like, logical standpoint, Marxism has no content. Right. right? Like... Other so than, I guess so you're saying that as a not as a normative thing, but as a like factual thing. <laughs> that, that that right. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that there is uh, a sense that you could actually you can actually make a similar argument with Alice there. I think, uh, in the sense that um, he, he says that and I think he takes this from Mao. That a revolution requires like a, there's an economic aspect, there's a political aspect, and there's the ideological aspect, uh, and the the only like the, the determining what makes this ideology like the revolutionary or part of the working class is just its connection to these uh, like the economic and political aspects. It doesn't have to have like a particular like Marxist content. Um, and in in that sense, like like the, the what Althusser is doing in trying to formulate uh, Marxism as a science is in some sense to separate it from that, I feel like. Um, so to, what Althusser is doing to formulate Marxism as a science is to make it not a science and not a philosophy at the same time. I think he makes it a science. I think What he the succeeds. fuck is a science to you? I think, well, what, uh, and I was, this is what I've been trying to get at in the research that since you've challenged me to become on here, uh, I, I've been trying to get at what Althusser believes the science is. I think that it's not all that different from um, structurally from what uh, like Kuhn describes this as a science, like in the way that paradigm shifts work. Um, and that that's that to Althusser basically uh, a science, something that is, is it's getting at um, what uh, the relationship of objects are to each other, not um, whereas like ideology is like we're always it's like relating these things to the subject. And in the part that the problem with, for example, empiricism is that it's uh, using basically these naive categories that are actually a part of the subject to organize what it what it just says is a real object, but it's actually like the object of uh, our production of knowledge. Um, so he's trying to formulate, like he's not, the formulation of uh, like what's of, of, of objects to each other can never be just like empirical descriptions or observations because uh, those, like the categories that we use to make observations are come first. We don't get to make observations without them. Yeah, this is this is structuralism, but it's circular. I mean, it, it, it's fundamentally way. circular. Um, where do you, where do the observations that lead to your categories come from? So, I, I think that, that that's kind of defeating the like the the categories always come first. What the category? Okay, no, they don't. Where do you categories come from? The categories always come first. So you, you know this is a lamp because it is labeled a lamp. I'm going to grab a lamp right here. Take a lamp. We're getting the basic stuff here. This is a lamp. You yeah. know it's this lamp because it's axiomatically defined as a lamp. Okay, fine. Where does the input for you to call that to get the concept itself come from? Well, Althusser says, what? This idea that reality is structured like a language um, no, no, no. It, Althus is arguing the opposite of that. He's saying yeah. that reality cannot be structured like a language. He's arguing against all those people who are saying that uh, 
that right, is... but he but he then accepts that our concept of of knowledge works exactly like the structuralists say they do, which by the way is a 19th century understanding of psychology. So, like when you call this a science, um, I like laugh. I mean, I really laugh because you're making that word mean nothing. Um, like by science, you're not meaning something like Wissenschaft um, in the in the sense of Marx, which is just which doesn't mean science the way we mean it, but the French term of science does. So that. I, I like like this. This to me gets into a. Fa have you read E.P. Thompson's takedown of this? By the way, I have not. Okay, but I, but I will say you're not, you're not going to like it. But I, I'm basically, sure I won't. But basically, philosophically speaking, most of this is literally circular on a basic level. I'm not even getting to the Marxist interpretation stuff. The baggage from structuralism, like even though what even though what um what Althusser is positing is interesting in 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 that in the sense of that context because he's trying to point out the structuralist that hey okay the mind might work like a language um but but um reality doesn't fine interesting except the mind also might not work like a language the, yeah these I mean, are you can, you can his critique isn't just at language focused uh, metaphors of the mind I mean, I'm it, when I was um, uh, reading uh, Zizek's uh, Incontinence of the Void, he he critiques Althusser for having this clean division between idealism and materialism, and he's and he overcomes this by uh, imposing the uh, like Lacan's category of lack, not just onto our perception of reality, our experience of reality, but onto material reality itself. And that's an error, I think, because it's it's an imposition that we can it, we can say that it is possible, that it is possible that reality is structured like that, but we cannot say that it is necessarily structured like that, that it is a logical, um, like, necess necessary part of reality. All right. Hmm. What Althusser is doing is like by creating this clean category between idealism and materialism, it, he's doing it as a necessary point to defend the the, uh, the possibility of doing science, because that is a it's a relationship when you're doing science. You're uh, and maybe I'm reading too much of my own into Althusser, but I, I believe this is uh, what his like project is is to um, like, we need to assess like material reality, like of objects between each other, the subject, um, like the, it, it requires objectivity, basically. And objectivity is impossible. Like it, it's, you can't have a third person point of view, but we have to, um, and in that sense, there is no like real break between idealism and materials. I mean, never going to get a book that is just purely materialist it's not possible because we're this is confusing your experience of reality with reality itself though you're saying that an object cannot exist because you interpret an object in your own mind well that 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 is irrelevant to the object's existence like the uh, the subject object distinction mm -hmm. um is not like you can have objective knowledge all right like that's not actually what is at stake in a subject object distinction I mean, you need to, like, when we look, when we first come into the world and look at, like, we, we don't even realize that there are objects that don't relate to us, you know? Um, everything is, like, mystified in a way. So, in order to even, um, like, we need the subject object distinction in order to uh, just to, to figure out what's the subject basically in order to realize mm -hmm. what what's like 
what might not be the sub like what what can surprise us and i think that's the role of science like what, what we're doing with hypotheses is and testing things is looking for failures and surprises in our in our existing categories but then why what is ultra serious problem with empiricism his problem with empiricism now i think he has a like uh, a, a specific thing that he's going after um is that like if you're when, when you're just doing like normal empiricist observations um and you're like just trying to uh, count stuff or uh, like like statistics now i mean mm -hmm. it, it's it's very obvious in economics that all that people are really doing is um imposing their own categories onto this data to get um, the essence that they're looking for, right? Yes, and also not exactly that simple. So, like, I would agree with you, for example, that the role confirmation bias um, is going to be crucial here. And you also have cultural interpretation things. And Altusser gets at this, but he gets at this in a very, again, like, he's a philosopher in France in the 50s who came out of a largely Hegelian tradition, most of what he incorporates as the answer to the problems Hegelianism is other 17th and 18th century early proto-scientific philosophy mixed with a little bit of quasi-modern physics. And we can get into the aleatory turn stuff. But the thing is, if you took the aleatory turn thing, like the swerve or whatever in the philosophy of the encounter, and you take it seriously in light of modern physics, it actually can still be determinist or are not. And I don't really see what that saves. It, it actually, the entire ideological structure that, you, that you're describing seems to be an attempt to me to save a 19th century philosophy from the realization that the implications of modern science make a lot of those questions either A, they're bracketed out entirely. The subject-object distinction thing, for example, since it's, it's in the realm of phenomenology, is bracketed out of modern science. It's, it's not, it is like, when we talk about modern science as a corpus of things that exist right now, um, it's bracketed out. Here's, so, and this is actually, this will actually probably take us on an esoteric line mm -hmm. of thinking that I have. Right. Um, but I, I, I would be, argue- It's for me to be charitable to you if we're going to esoteric. <laughs> well, I, I've argued in the past that the basic, like science can never really escape the subject object distinction i mean we mm -hmm. can't like like we can try like objectivity because it's impossible um that we still have we have to come up with uh ways to deal with our like primordial abstractions our the, we have to deal with the fact that um like the w with um like mysticism basically that we are born into and the, the things that go with that like uh uh religion god and all that kind of stuff um and i like that i like zizek's uh, christian atheism as a way out of this um that uh we need um god basically to uh as, as a way to bracket out as a way to get rid of the subject's inherent mysticism and actually do science and look at the relationship of objects between each other. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you, mm -hmm. one, you have one advantage of me is I've never read Philosophy of the Encounter because I have always assumed that the aleatory materialism stuff coming out of Spinoza what and also given the state of Althusser's mind when he was writing it, that I was afraid that maybe I was going to go off into crazy land because <laughs> because because his depression was becoming like you know the the mean joke I made about uh, the death of, of Ryman aside, um, his depression was becoming acute starting in 1978. Right, like I know enough about his biography to know that. Um, and he was also, during this time period, interestingly realizing that his initial interpretation of Marx with the, with the strong 
like the basically if you read his work from like uh reading capital forward you just you you have the epistemological break being moved and softened and moved and softened and moved and softened which i will give him credit for actually because it it is it shows that he was being honest his initial theories were made off of reading like five or ten texts of marx it wasn't a lot and noticing some pretty big jumps without and the contextual stuff that we have now on what Marx was thinking, how he was thinking it, what where it placed in his biography, that was largely lost um, with actually Stalin's purge of one dude in the Soviet Union um, and only really revitalized recently when they started going back through the letters. Um, it's not to say we didn't have more Marxist texts than the like what was being thrown around commonly in the Soviet Union by by the 1950s we did but we didn't have the context for it um and so like Althusser is revising that throughout the time Althusser is also dealing with the fact I think he realizes that this structuralist science and this highly deterministic science that they're all kind of modeled on like it, like the gold standard of science and we're throwing this word around a lot so we're gonna have to get into this um, science at the time is like Newtonian mechanics and it's falling apart. Yeah. Like it works. It's and that, that actually it is in and of itself a problem. Like Newtonian science works and yet it's also not strictly speaking true. Yeah. I will like, critique Althusser on one respect in the way okay. he describes science in mm -hmm. that in reading capital, he says it, it's actually like science actually isn't teleological or progressive. Uh, be, be, for various reasons. I think he's wrong because when we do have paradigm shifts in science, and I think this is a difference between, a, a big difference between science and ideology, um, is that when we have those paradigm shifts, the, the, the new solution, like general relativity, still has to solve all the same problems that Newtonian physics did. Right, and if it doesn't, it is unlikely to stick as a paradigm. Yes, right? whereas in ideology, and we see this in like uh, whatever economics and political theory and all that kind of stuff, that it doesn't have to solve all those old problems. It just has to solve the last one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, yeah, it, it actually can ignore all the... Pro so this is interesting, and it actually gets into another tension between Marx and Althusser that I think Althusserians in France have really done a lot with. Um, so we can be back to being charitable here. Um, Nico, I warned you. We had a long discussion about how combative I am. <laughs> um, no, I appreciate um, it. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, I'm not going to shoot you on air. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, the it, and in, in all seriousness, there is an interesting development with Balabar pointing out that like he that Balabar thinks Altusir is onto something with this ideology, but also points out that that doesn't totally work with his epistemological break. And we've already talked about like Althusser real is realizing the problems with that. Yeah. Because the move from talking about ideology to talking about um, commodity fetishes and, and in like Marxist use of ideology, uh, Balabar says in the philosophy of Marxism is like, his, and, and if you do like the early philological work, Marx doesn't have a theory of ideology. It's like the word that they threw around for shit they don't like that they think are stupid um, in the Hege in like the left Hegelian term that was also being used in the left Hegelian world to mean false belief. And I think Althusser knows that, okay, ideology can't just be false belief. It's got to be more complicated than that. Um, but he also doesn't mean what like Marx's, uh, Marx's reification theory in like, you have social you have social relations hidden in abstraction that abstraction is itself um a, a thingification a reification uh you know i i use thingification because a lot of these terms like we get in the overdetermination are weird in that even in marxism there's both the standard pre marx or pre altusir or pre structuralist meaning and then there's a new meaning and in Althusser, this is maddening. Um, and I'll talk about like sometimes, like when Althusser say, like, says synchronic and diachronic, he means something completely different than what every other person in France at the time means by it. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what those words mean in English. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, well, synchronic means like it. So, like, and synchronic and diachronic and and structuralism means like the meaning of a word across time and the meaning of a word in the same time. So, like, Altusier redefines those. Um, and actually, when I first read Altusier, I completely misinterpreted him in an, an even less charitable way than I am now because I didn't realize he had a unique definition from the rest of structuralism, right? So there's there are all these things in Althusser that are really distorting, I think, unless you do a lot of work in him in specific, because he's he does this thing that Deleuze does too, where- well, You gotta um, use the context clues, you know? That's what it's all about. Well, okay, here's the thing. With Deleuze, there's only context, and like, he, there, like, okay. There's Deleuze and there's Deleuze and Guattari. Guattari is crazy, but like with Deleuze and Guattari is consistent. Deleuze by himself, each text has a completely different, maybe even theoretical apparatus than the prior text he was writing about. And good luck, unless you know that, understanding what's going on. Um, okay, I got a question. Farn, when you talk about glass floor, what do you mean? Uh, unrelated, but... Um, uh, what I mean when I talk about glass floor is uh, the minimum you're allowed to fail without either a familiar or, so or social safety net stopping you. Um, in terms of Althusser, you could say that is part of the... Would that be an ideological or repressive structural apparatus, Nico? Uh, <laughs> <that>. Well... Uh, <laughs> Probably an ideological one, because I mean, it's what like uh, it's coming from the family, it's the churches, it's mm -hmm. uh, those other kind of stuff that's doing it. Um, yeah. That that is your fallback, basically. All uh, right. So, what's to 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 get to, into the meat of the contention, so we can talk about the philosophy of encounter. Let's go back to not step one, where I'm saying that structuralism is circular, and that's all to say or sucks. Um, but into like some key definitions in Altusser that are different or maybe unique. The synchronic and diachronic stuff doesn't come up very often. It like comes up in one text that I've read so far. Um, but stuff that does come up a, a lot is interpolation and overdetermination. All right. Now, how is that different in Altusser? And for people coming out of the Althusserian French wankery tradition, um, as opposed to people who come out of the British wankery tradition are my favorite, the German wankery tradition. Um, everybody's equally wankery. Um, so what, what, is, what is interpolation and, um, and uh, um, because I think this is where you think of the key ideas that we one can pull from Althusser, right? Hmm. This is the beginnings of the stuff that you think is important. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah. So, interpolation, go. I mean, the, the classic example that he gives is like, it, it's what like the, the subject, uh, like how, how the subject identifies with, so like, so like the classic example, there's a cop that says, hey you, um, and you turn around. Uh, like and you become like the subject of of that, like he, right. yeah. By turning around, you've admitted to identification with the you. Thus, yeah. in a kind of like tricky way, you've also admitted admitted to being subject to um, the cop, and that works on the ideological level. And yeah. so that would be part of the ideological state apparatus. The well, state it, apparatus. It, it, it's well. I mean, it's also useful as like a, a concept uh, in in terms of. Like establishing meaning and and in time and stuff, right? Like so, like it, it shows how uh, the 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 line of meaning can be established retroactively and still be meaningful. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so um, and subject and subject object divide stuff. When you talk about like Lacanian psychoanalysis, this is also part of that. Like so, like the fact that when I realize that I am a that I'm in a separate self and there is a world beyond me. I also retroject that back in time to the period where I was in the mirror phase and the, yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. So, 
some I, I think that's interesting um what i find interesting about and this is a problem in philosophy of science in, in general are we naming multiple processes that are real or are we actually coming up with a causal mechanism so like um and i'm gonna admit nico i'm i'm particularly mean person to argue with this about because before i got into left philosophy my hobby um was philosophy of science oh lovely i feel like i've walked into a trap i i warned you i actually kind of told you <laughs> you were stepping into a viper stand of one <laughs> um but but um so but let's 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 turn into that because i think though even if even if ultrasound is just describing something and not coming up with a causal mechanism it's still pretty real all right so like we know when we're interpolated like we become like we we retroject meaning onto this thing and the act you know and and, and it's an interesting way like as a side note i don't know how much you follow psychological studies like it seems like a lot of our thought actually works this way like oh, um yeah. even like, memory and stuff yeah. like that well yeah like like um like our, our memory of volition, like we actually probably have already decided something before we're conscious of our decision to have done it. Yeah. Um, and interpolation actually interestingly gets you out of a lot of weird debates that, that come up in like current contemporary analytic philosophy about like whether or not it's meaningful to say people even have agency because like, well, the time stuff doesn't seem to work right. Like, and interpolation is just like, of course they do. It doesn't matter. You were interpolated. Yeah, move on. Like <laughs> that's what's so nice about it. <laughs> it is. It is sort of like as an epistemic problem. Um, mm -hmm. I think it does solve a lot. Um, over determination, though. Let's talk about the way Althusser defines that versus the way it is used in, say, like traditional logic, because it has a meaning in traditional logic. Okay. I was not aware of that meaning. I, I thought it was just a, a psychoanalytic concept. Nope. They got it from logic. Ah. So you... Most Freud is either either ripped off Nietzsche or ripped off Aristotle. Just like, heads up. <laughs> um. So did you want to... Like, well, what, what's your angle here? No, like, uh, my, my angle? Yes, yeah, I see. Now you're trying to predict where I'm coming at you. This is You're not a good pugilist by telling me you're doing that. Um, <laughs> I'm too honest. I'm sorry. Yes. An honest Altusarian. It's almost sad. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no. So, okay. So, overdetermination in, in logic actually has a relationship to the way it's used in Altusarian. So what's interesting about this is like all these errors use of the meaning is actually a refinement of a more traditional meaning. So the traditional meaning is you have underdetermination, which means you have too little effect um, to determine a cause. Okay. Um, so like I like either it's correlative or there's like it's a weak effect, it's even a weak correlation, right? So it's underdetermined. Like I can't tell you the cause, there's no way to know it. Then there's overdetermination, which is actually the opposite problem. There are so many contributing factors that are strong that I can't pinpoint to any one of them as a causal mechanism. So that's what it means in like traditional logic. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to let you, as the person who doesn't have a, a deaf grudge against the Althusserians in the world, to charitably represent overdetermination as understood by Althusserians. I mean, I'll probably point to like um uh, i think that richard wolf actually has the greatest uh summarization of it in uh contending economic theories and basically it just means it's the same thing as uh uh what's the word it, like endogenous relationship it, it's reflected back both ways um and but it also i think it also has that sense of uh i think he uses it both ways mm -hmm. of there are too many causes um to determine like what what is the the real uh cause here like it, from the point of theory we could just as much say that it is a, a random variable 
Right. So yeah. So um, yeah. I'm going to find a quote. Drawing from both Freud and Mao. Also, as a side note, did Alto Sarah read Chinese? I don't think so. Moving on. Um, <laughs> I, 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 people listening, this is me being funny. I'm now being just an asshole. Um, so, so Alto Sarah, see, I am actually going to the source of all knowledge, which. Uh, and this is from, where is this from? Where is this quote from? I love that you called it the, the Althusserian Bible in that other stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to find, I have found a quote. Oh, yes, Brewster. Um, uh, Brewster, who is Brewster here? All right. So, Brewster summarizes for the the from contradiction and overdetermination, um, and I'll then read what Althusser wrote about this himself. Um, Althusser uses overdetermination to describe the effects of contradictions. Contradictions here being used in the Hegelian and Marxist sense in each practice, constituting a social formation on, uh, a social formation on the social formation as a whole. Yeah, that's not helpful, Brewster. And hence, back on each piece and practice and each contradiction, defining the pattern of dominance, the sort of a nation, antagonism and non-antagonism, the contradictions, the structure of dominance in any given historical moment. More precisely, the overdetermination of, of a contradiction is a reflection of it of its conditions of existence within the complex whole. That is, of the contradictions in the in the complex whole. In other words, of an uneven development. That doesn't help. Um, I think maybe a bit too much emphasis on contradiction there. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, well, we could I'm, just. Yeah. I mean, I could read out loud the entire short chapter con from Reading Capital Contradiction and Overdetermination and mock it the entire time. But um, I do think there is an interesting thing where Altusser is using over determination and both the traditional mean like I meant and also there there is a mirroring and building. What I find interesting about Althusserian structuralism, all right, that is similar to something that you're not going to like, but is actually similar to something that analytic, analytic Marxists try to do, which is abstract from the hyper periodization of Hegelianism where like, you know, um, there is a Hegelian uh, like you can only talk about something um, in its in its period of development towards the teleological thing. So like, like oh yeah, I, I would agree with something that. different. And the, and what the Althusserians are trying to do, I think, is trying to like not do away with that, but abstractify something that you could apply to multiple epochs. Okay. Um, interestingly. This is what Foucault and the episteme throws back out. So, like, while I do think the episteme does is actually an inheritor of uh, Althusserian notions of ideology, it tries to get out of this problem of like, okay, we're going to try to describe something that is transhistorical um, by abstraction by just saying, "Nah." I mean, like, I, I know that sounds super simplistic. Well, I, that's what I, I think it's doing. Well, I, I would say that um, the idea that ideology is transhistorical is very important here, and yeah, but I would also say it means that it, you you are not dealing with anything recognizable to Marxism at all. Well, I, maybe not to Marx of like the German ideology, but I would say that you're not dealing with the the Marx of late Marx that epistemological. Yeah, I, I'm saying that like the way that. Marx talks about ideology. He, he is making, I think he makes several errors and utopian errors because of this, that uh, he thinks that um, uh, that ideology can basically be abolished uh, by the end of politics and communism. Um, and like the, for Alphys there, ideology is something like inherent to the subject, which is funnily also how was I think uh, Alan Greenspan was talking about it in in the in Congress. I love that uh, that back and forth, um, but uh, it 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 is something inherent to 
it, interacting with the world and uh, and in, engaging with it. What Marx does, and I I want your uh, this is something I've been holding in my pocket for you, mm -hmm. um, is he makes it, it he makes this leap, and I it, that um, you and Doug and many others seize on that in in the negatively defining communism and socialism, um, you are not escaping the utopianism of people say like. Uh, cockshot when he writes towards new socialism and you know his whole a uh, plan for the for the future um because what that does what uh these predictions of the end of ideology of the end of politics the end of the division of labor doesn't necessarily follow from the teleological argument that he produces it doesn't necessarily follow that the negation of the negation, that the expropriation of the expropriators will produce a society without the division of labor and without um, politics. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I actually would. And I actually, I mean, like, th this is this is interesting because you've tripped on something that the Frankfurt School goes into, and they actually almost give up. I mean, Debatably, some of them give up on Marxism, um, depending on because they chose the other side of that. They chose to be on the utopian side. Well, um, to some degree, um, and I spelled this out with Doug Lane in a pop the left. The Marxist critique of utopians can be applied to Marxism itself in a way that no one, even off to Seer, has fully gotten around. Um, and that is, for example, if you critique utopians for making plans that are um, before the democratic polity of the time can and can actually democratically engage them, which was one of the critiques made um, and, uh, in uh, um, socialism, utopia, and scientific, that's true of Marxism. Um, if you, it's definitely true of any Marxism that thinks that Marxism has a definite program that can be imposed by a minority upon, upon a majority, particularly in time. So um, I will say that Althusser's response, well, I, what I would say Althusser's response would be uh, is that this is a part of the process of creating an ideology associated with uh, like an undercurrent of revolution and like the, the working class. Um, like you can't, like, it is not scientific, which is correct. Um, but it's also a necessary part of, uh, engaging with politics and, and, um, and trying to like, uh, do revolution and change the world and stuff. It, okay. Yeah. Is imperialism... The cause of our subject to capitalism. Answer. Say it again. Is imperialism the cause of and thus a catered out contradiction, contradiction or the result of capitalism? Answer. Uh, in capitalism, it is caused by capitalism. Okay. Why did I ask you that question in context uh, of what I just did? I don't know. Did it come up in the chat? Nope. Okay, I don't know. You don't know. Do you want me to guess? Yes. Um, I'm being a pedagogical asshole. So. Yes. Okay. So you're. So is the suggestion that um, that utopians like? I mean, I'll just say like, we'll probably say that utopianism is like a symptom of, like, it, it, symptomatic of like. Um, the working class movement or something. Mm -hmm. that would, like that. And that's probably weirdly like something I wouldn't even disagree with. I might think I might conceive it in a different reasons. Um, my, my, my question is um, based on one of the fundamental things that led, that led uh, Otto Serra into his particular reading of overdetermination is to try to justify a particular problem that emerges from Maoism. 
Um, and it, this is specific to, this is the only thing out of all the things people normally think is associated with Maoism that's specific to Maoism and not Stalinism. Or Marxist Leninism, if I'm being PC to the Marxists who get mad when you call a thing what it is. Um, was it the non contradictory, or the non resolving contradictions? It was, it, it's non resolving contradictions, which is also like the, the, the primary and secondary contradiction um, in Maoism. So Mao's innovation is to say everything in classical Marxist Leninism is true, um, but the most important thing to combat is not um, capitalism, it is imperialism. So right. that combating imperialism is more important then, and he actually could even justify this in like, you know, traditional Marxist views of national liberation. I bring this up because it's the only substantive distinction between um, a lot of Maoist politics and a lot of Trotskyist politics and a lot of like classical Marxist Leninist politics is not if they even disagree on the course of action in the third world. It is why they think it is important and who they think it is okay to side with. Um, it seems to me, and I bring this up in the course of why, why he would do this in terms of why Althusser in particular, dealing with the crisis of communism in France and Maoism's like intervention upon this crisis. Um, and I'm going to throw some more history at you that, that in a minute, but, um, and it's not directly related to Althusser, but Maoism seemed to represent in uh, in for the French context, what Trotskyism represented in the U.S. context, and in the U.S. context in the fifties and sixties, you had both the problem of the Cold War itself, but you also had the fact that like to break away from the CPUSA, um, which had been in a popular front with the Democrats since nineteen thirty six, roughly. Um, your your way of doing that was to go Maoist um, or to go Trotskyist. But the Maoist distinction in America only really made sense if you were arguing for like internal sub, uh, subjugated nations. Um, Trotskyism also thought those things were important, actually, and like made a big deal out of it, despite what a lot of people will predict, like Trotsky didn't care about. And yeah, Trotsky was insistent on national liberation. It was a big part of his platform. It's actually one of the big dividing lines between kinds of Trotskyists. Um, and so in America, the Trotskyist answer to this, what was often seen as the way to not just buck the buck um, uh, like Democrats, but also buck the, the CPUSA, which was so tied to them. Um, in France, you don't have the same, you have a popular front strategy, but the, the, the communist party of France does not have the exact same relationship to like the Gaullism, like the popular front is over. But you and, know, there is a funny story in there though, right? Mm -hmm. With, um, uh, the Algiers crisis. Bingo. Okay. Yes. Like, so I want you to like elaborate on that. I think you're onto something. I think you're getting one yeah, of you get think about. Yeah, so the the, the French um, didn't. Uh, uh, well, w when the French were losing uh, in Algeria, the generals did a coup. Mm -hmm. There's actually several Algiers crises, but in this one, um, they did. A, they tried to do a coup, and all of France basically rose up against them, including the Communist Party in defense of De Gaulle, mm -hmm. um, which was quite something to see. And I guess it's analogous in, in, I'm assuming you're trying to draw the analogy there between uh, imperialism and this ex the external threat of uh, the generals. Yeah, well, I think, I think um, part, of, part of the crisis of the Communist Party in France is related to the fact it couldn't take a coherent line from its own stance of national liberation mm -hmm. on Algeria. Now, they also couldn't before and in, in, like... What's interesting is why why was Algeria different than Indo uh, than Indochina? All right, like why would you know? Or what we well, Indochina? I guess I guess the difference to them would have been that they considered Algeria part of metropolitan France, right? And Indochina is more clearly colonial. 
Yeah. Um, this, you know, this crisis and the crisis mm -hmm. of the fact that the CP, the the other crisis that Rentier and um, that Rentier really seizes upon, and so does Badu. We, but but uh, Badu really, and I think this is a, but but I don't know what you know about Badu. Um, for, I'm gonna spell Only it. Little. Uh, Only whatever hey. Zizek has mentioned about him. Yeah. Um, I read Badu before I read Zizek just because of the weird nature of of trends in academia when I was in, when I was finishing my graduate school. Um, um, and yeah, uh, there's some stuff coming up to this too. Um, one of the things that I would uh, say with Badu is Badu actually has this weird relationship with Althusser as he basically says, Althusser isn't malice enough. Um, you didn't have enough faith in the cultural revolution. Just take the right side on 68. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think it's interesting, right? Because, um, the other crisis for the C, uh, for the, for the communist party of France is 68 because they basically mm -hmm. side with the, the Gaulist government kind of off of pop front lines. It's discrediting a lot of the 68ers side with the Maoist, but the Maoist interestingly in themselves, the Maoist parties were also generally, they were split themselves on how to respond to 68. And this is similar to where the Maoist parties in America were um, and how to respond to 69 and the SDS, like whether or not they should embrace it or, you know, hold to a more traditional communist line. Well, you know, um, what's funny in, in this whole discussion of like the of third worldism in France, mm -hmm. like one of the funniest things that often gets forgotten is that there was a proposal um, after World War II that like when they were trying to figure out how, what to do with all the French colonies in Africa, um, like, well, maybe we can ad admit them all to the, um, it, it make them make France one big country, including all of like French Africa. Mm -hmm. And even uh, the communist party was opposed to that. I can't remember why, um, but it, it seems like that probably would have been better than what ended up happening. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think this is this. Uh, what comes up that's also relevant, and we'll try to get back to the weird philosophical stuff because this has been all over the place. Like I've yes. jumped from basic philosophy, the philosophy of science, to the actual contextual history. And but, we need um, to jump from here to the state and uh, professionalization. Yeah, yeah we, we got to jump to a lot of stuff. Uh, but mm -hmm. one of the big contentions within Trotskyism in the 1960s and 70s, writes Kilgore Trout in the comments, um, are Kilgore Kraut. Uh, that's even funnier in the comments was whether to continue a policy of armed struggle in Latin America. And part, part of the issue, okay, is this reversal of the contradictions leads to Maoism have a, having a more peasant centric focus. You, you actually see this a lot in their, the people's war. That's really about peasant stuff, frankly. Um, but also having a weird relationship to what they should do with the peasants. Like it leads to like, you know, the shining path being like, are we, of the peasants, or are we just going to kill them? Um, and that's a gross oversimplification that's completely unfair, but kind of like they do end up like like the Shining Path's leadership was mostly actually um, academics. Like, uh, I think I, Jason Unruh considered himself like uh, allied with the Shining Light at one point. Oh, Shining one Path variation yeah. of it. Yeah, I. I remember Jason Unruh at one point supporting the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya and then like a few months later pretending like <laughs> it never happened. So I just ignore <laughs> like as much as, okay, as bad as people think bread tube is. Yeah, early, they, don't, they don't remember. They don't remember. Early, early Marx tube is <laughs> so much worse. Um, it was, I like, I almost for a while was like, this is this a psyop? Um well, now he works for Iranian state TV. So yes, um, yeah. Well, who doesn't? Uh, I won't say anything about other figures like that, like Caleb Maupin. Um, but um, <laughs> I, I point this out because I think Ultrasair is trying to deal with this crisis theoretically. Like, like that's part of the context. It's not so much a crisis in Marx. There's a bunch of crises in Marx that are emerging. But a crisis in like his dealing with the 
with the pressures of the of the Communist Party of France, trying to be loyal to it. But he, he did seem to be a loyal opposition, which in weirdly leads to this thing that I that blows my mind, which is the emergence of structural Marxism in Britain, which is a Trotskyist phenomenon. Yeah, I couldn't uh, explain it to you. <laughs> um, like, like, I mean, I can tell you historically how it happened. It's like the bugaboo of one of the leaders of the British uh, SWP, which is the Cliffite, you know, the representative of the IS tradition in Britain. Um, and they kind of were flirting with analytical Marxism and kind of flirting with structural Marxism, Austrasyrianism as the answer. And like, that informed, even though um, New uh, New Left Review was split from them and was never formally affiliated, that also informed the kind of weird. Um, you ever wondered why, like Verso, is like weirdly Maoist and Trotskyist, and then a lot of random French crap? Yeah. Um, like originally, that had to do with the particular theoretical apparatuses of like post Hegelian British heter heterodox Trotskyism. And that's who they were marketing to. And later, it just because like academics are weird, and you can like throw all the cool, hip, weird academic stuff. Now they, we have the Verso loft. Yes. Well, I mean, Verso has been a corporate press now for at least two decades. Mm -hmm. But it originally was a was a a new. It was part of like it was New Left Review Press. And let me see where does the New Left Review come from? I'm gonna. I've gotten this wrong before. People were arguing with me, so I'm gonna make sure I get spell it, spade its origins correctly. Um, the New Left Review comes out of, it comes out of The Reasoner, which interestingly actually is started partially by E.P. Thompson, who hated Althusser, um, but it gets, uh, combined with Stuart Hall and Perry Anderson, and Perry Anderson has more, um, uh, let's say Gramscian, uh, sort of dissident Marxist-Leninist uh, origins as opposed to the other part of the British tradition, which is highly Leninist, and they kind of combine. And the trends in the SWP also mean there's a market for it. Um, it is actually weirdly similar to what happened with MR, which is the Hal Draper publication, which is now like largely like everything in the kitchen sink Maoism, but actually starts off as a as a kind of dissonant Trotskyist journal, um, but with no line. That was its, that was its thing. Like um, we can't have a line. Marxism's too messed up now to have a line. So we are deliberately taking an everything in the kitchen sink approach to the crisis of Marxist theory. You know, um, the one thing I really do love about Althusser is that he managed to present himself basically as the new orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one of the reasons why I, I cloak myself in him to it, to present myself as the more orthodox option than all these people, the, like especially the the new the the, the post left populist people uh, saying oh, they're the yeah. real Marxists and stuff. Um, <laughs> the right wing of right wing Marxism, like yeah. Um, when I say right wing Marxism. Guys, I uh, I don't mean right wing on the traditional scale. I mean like um, reformist Marxism, and uh, yeah, it's whew. um What's interesting though, and one thing that I, that I always warn about, it doesn't come up on Pop the Left a lot, but I warn about it in general, is convergent tendencies have a tendency to emerge in every single ideological formation. Yeah. So, for example, Nas, uh, Nas bowls emerge heavily in Maoist circles, um, and they even and I, I had a Maoist talk to me about like the dangers of Nas bowlism and Maoism, like, and um, and it also of course heavily in social democratic circles, um, and you I, know, there, the real horseshoe. Yeah, and there's literally like uh, right wingers who have a cult of Stalin based off Francis Yaki. Like that's real. Like in the fascist international, because they like had they were like, why not Hitler and Stalin? Um, like uh, Alexander Dugan and um, Eduard Limonov are not the people who invented that. 
like that mm -hmm. actually come weirdly comes out of America. Um, and yeah, it was like, yeah. Um, if you want to study that, read the book Dreamer of the Day. I don't want to stretch to study uh, that. <laughs> I, I study right wing stuff, so you don't have to. I but... I know right wing stuff very well from the forums. I do not. <laughs> I, you oh, know, the... see, see, this is this is the, that. That's the Nagel problem, assuming you understand right-wing stuff from forums. Um, but I also I mean, understand it from watching hate what Hagel's done, or <laughs> Nagel's done. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, I, 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 know. I consistently are you say gonna, this. Are you going to be post-Altisarian soon? I, I doubt it. I, I, I'm very stubborn. I that will say this. I have back on my side. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Say it. Say what? I'm, what was I'm, I saying? I'm derailing you. I'm being an asshole. Oh, I was saying. Um, I will say that I my hypothesis about the the post left uh, populace. I I don't want to say just post left because that does a disservice to uh, Sal Newman. Really, yeah, like the the post left anarchist and the post yeah. left left communist. The, uh -huh. Like the but, people who you you might hate for different reasons. Um, yeah, but these people they came from Reddit. And that's the problem, uh, is that Reddit and Twitter they didn't they don't know like uh, what like how awful these like the alt right really was. Yeah, and they and so they were never inoculated to it. Um, well, I mean, like um, the alt right. Uh, this gets into sketchy stuff about my past. Um. um the alt rights origins are in uh, the students of Paul Gottfried. I mean, that's where the branding comes from. It was a rebranding of modern traditionalism or radical traditionalism from like uh, the European you right, specifically for America, but actually made more explicitly racialist than it even is in its French context. Um, and they tried to do it all crypto for a while. Richard Spencer was like yeah. the arts editor for America Conservative. Um, and like around, I think around 2009, um, when I had become a leftist and was writing on Adorno, um, I actually remembered his work on Adorno and knew that he had written. Uh, and I wrote him before, like as he was coming up with the alt right. And then I was like, oh, he's attached to MPI. Oh, MPI is in crypto Nazi stuff. And then we're for like 10 years, uh, not 10 years, like for until Trump, no one knew who this guy was. And then everyone made him famous and then destroyed him, you know. Um, and, and like the same motion, it was like lifting him up just to smash him down. Um, but uh, the 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 radical traditionalist stuff, that 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 goes back to France and to uh into Russia going back like 50, 60 years. Like there's a long history of that. Um, well, and I suppose we can bring this back to Althusser for a moment because yeah, let's, let's do that, that. His, that history is actually false. It's it's a it's a illusionary history. It's interpolation, um, and because like what w what's actually here is a series of like class phenomena. Is it is, is these are the ideologies are associated with certain material undercurrents they're not act the history of them is not a history as a history of discourses so if we wanted to do a real history of the alt-right we need to go and study the the class history of um male lumen pro uh, neats basically well if i wanted to actually tell you the social demographic overlap between the post left um, the average dsa -er and uh, the alt-right as it existed post-2005, what would you think the common similarities would be? Like in the actual, like intellectual bit? Like what race of, are they? Sorry? What race are they? Uh, mostly white. And? Educated. Uh, no, what other race would, would be involved? Oh. Um, Nick Frentes. You have the rise of the Latino white nationalists. Oh, that's not new. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always been uh, it, it, as as an atomized, you know, sub like uh, middle class subject. 
it, it's very annoying um, to, to, to think about like the, the people who are very up in arms about that kind of stuff. So let, let's actually like tie this to, I'm going to let you, instead of arguing me about all too where, where, we're like we're gonna talk past each other because I, I mm-hmm. I've done this for ten years and this is a really unfair fight, um, and I have no interest in fighting it fairly. Um, uh, let's actually talk. Let's do some application where I'm gonna give you a charitable, for real, um, mm-hmm. ability to apply some of this in a way that will make what you're talking about either make sense or not. So let's let's uh, talk about the overlap between these weirdo current round of lumping some things. I don't even know that they're pros. Um, well, I think, I don't think, are, are we talking about, wh- wh- what are we talking about? Which phenomena are we talking about? Yeah. Well, one, someone's like, Latino is a, is a geographic signifier that can both Latino and, and racially right. It isn't a contradiction. No, it's it is a linguistic. A it's a linguistic. But, but then no, again, no. like, what does racially white mean? <laughs> like, like, that's also, that's an ethno linguistic paradigm more than, a, more, like, unless you are an actual race realist and think that that's meaningful. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, the, yeah, I you, because my skin color has been absolutely no barrier to me being mistaken as a Mexican when I lived in Mexico. Like, you and know, people like, often think I'm like Egyptian or something when I have my beard on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I also Afghani. got that too. I got last. I got light skinned Egyptian um, when I lived in Egypt, and and also you're completely right. And interesting to get into like the morphology of race. Everyone's like, oh, well, everyone knows who everyone tells. I'm like, Egyptians can't tell. Egyptians from Latinos. When I when I had Latino mm-hmm. friends who lived in Egypt, they could not tell the difference because the, di- the the signifiers are actually mainly linguistic in both cases. Do you Alien know what isn't really a race either? <laughs> like, you know what the funniest and worst example of that I've heard. My dad would actually tell me stories about when he was growing up in Texas and when the uh, Iranian hostage situation happened. Like a bunch of like Latino people just got beat up because people thought they were Iranian. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you another story that makes it even more complicated. Um, the Mexican consulate attache took a trip to the White Desert in 2015. I was in Egypt at the time. And the Egyptian security forces mistook them for Berbers and bombed them. Wow. Um, so the moral of this story is, is like, it's not that, that, that's not just like white people making the mistake. It is that the the racial categorizations we think are clear to us kind of aren't in other contexts. Um, and so I think it's perfect. It, it, it make it is not a contradiction to me that there are Latino white nationalists. The most, the most, the largest group of Nazis I've ever sat down and have a, comp- a conversation with was in Mexico, in northern Mexico, for real. They were some. There's weird well, I mean, Sonoran, and some of them were mestizo. So it's not even like yeah. the racial. I mean, what's the joke on like um, the four chance poll form? Is that no one on poll is white, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, so, but I bring this up. So let's let's talk about interpolation here and like yes. the, the the class demographics. One of the things that people have noticed is that there's this PMC thesis. I've written right? a lot about that. Yeah, I man, I have too. And and you and I both agree that professionalization and the stuff that they're responding to is real ish yeah. um however the creation of of a pmc sounds a lot like other right wing adjacent frankly conspiracy theories in the past um i don't like using your term structural anti-semitism for this because i actually don't think it's limited to that for example when i think of like uh the the role that um Chinese play in Mexico. Um, if you you might know about this, like like when I taught in northern Mexico, like 
explicit racism was pretty much verboten. Implicit colorism was uh, tolerated, but everyone felt bad about it. But hating Chinese people was okay. <laughs> like it was very. I mean, that's kind of true in America a little bit. Um, I mean, at least up until now. up it until a few weeks ago. Um, and that's because even in America, the Chinese are like honestly structurally similar to Jews in the sense they're associated with a fairly well-off model minority that is seen to have some kind of um, systemic advantage over other minorities, but also a threat, thus also being a threat potentially to the majority group. I mean, there's a big um, overlap in like the kind of, in the people who do race science, it, it, like in, academically, always say they love the Jews and the Chinese, you know? And like right. Charles, uh, wh what's the guy's name? The uh, the the bell curve guy. Charles uh, Murray. Yeah, it is married to. Uh, she's Asian. I don't remember what nationality, um, but is always like saying like the is kind of like Asian supremacist when he's asked about it, mm -hmm. because that's yeah. the logical conclusion. You you see this a lot, and um, weirdly also in Asian right wing. Uh, world, even in China, uh, there is a China. There is an Asian right wing in China. I know people don't believe this. Um, there, there is a lot of marrying of of um, of that, but not for Asian supremacy. It's usually reduced down to the specific country that you're in, because Asia mm -hmm. is actually kind of a foreign concept in Asia. Yeah. Um. So, so to get to Altusier's usefulness in this, and I'm going to help you out here. We're going to build a charitable case for why. Derek should not continue his crusade against Althusser. And it's an okay because it's a white on white crusade. Um, <laughs> so don't get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> um, so you may even argue it's like a, anyway, I won't go there. Um, um, so um, let's talk about this for a second. Are we so, talking about the, the PMC? Yeah, let's talk about what 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 not just does the PMC function as in this uh, in this analysis, but also what does the the PMC debate function as in this analysis? Um, are Burnham's theoretical ancestors really all conspiracy theorists? Um, they're all adjacent or are very similar circles, but Lynn didn't seem like a conspiracy. Th ah, yeah, they're showing up. Um, Lynn, I, I think I know who you are. Um, Lind, Lind is not a conspiracy theorist. Lind is a uh, corporatist nationalist. And Lind's theories, but Lind's theories do come from Burnham's. Burnham, however, if you read the New Machiavellians, explicitly pulls from Pareto, um, which isn't in and of itself necessarily a problem, and a bunch of, of um, fascist adjacent people explicitly. Um, and in the in the managerial revolution, he actually thought it was three different managerial elites, and that the one that was most like fascism was going to win. That the uh, business man the the business managerial elite and the communist managerial elite were not be able to compete with the military managerial elite, and that America to protect liberty needed to mirror a military uh, managerial elite to not succumb to fascism, um, but but to not succumb to fascism by adopting fascist tactics. Um, this is often ignored when people talk about Burnham. Lind decontextualizes Burnham and rereads him through Weber. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, Sorrell. Um, are they conspiracy theorists? Well, Sorrell actually is not actually a conspiracy theorist, but he thinks conspiracy theories are functionally useful. They're useful myths about who the enemy is. Sorry, Nico, I didn't realize that people were going to throw, like, contingent bombs while we were trying to fight amongst ourselves. No, it um, gave me a second to think, which I needed. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it, it's, yeah, I train debaters. It's really not fair. Um, um, and this is what, by, by the way, guys, this is why I don't really don't do internet debates, because they're not fair. They're, they're spectacle. And so, like, by doing this with Nico, one of my ways of being charitable is by pointing out the absurdity of doing an internet debate. Um, because you know I'm not being fair. Um, so, Nico, in all seriousness, 
what what do you want to do with this? So if we're going to say that there is there is both a reason for the theory of the PMC, but the, theory, the PMC serves a function from an Althusserian structural analysis, what do you got? Okay, so I, I, most of my structural analysis has been to I, saying what the PMC is. So this is going to be a new thing for me. I have said I have done a more discur discursive analysis of the PMC and what function it roles, but we can say that like well, who's mostly talking about it? It's people who usually would be classified as PMC, yeah, in, in some way or another. Um, so that, that means that structurally they're a part of um, like they have a liberal education, right? Um, Agreed. We're on the yes. same page. And conceded your point. <laughs> And uh, let's all let's then place the structural role of liberal education, um, which uh, and I actually love uh, of all people Samuel Huntington for this, mm -hmm. um, who uh, before he became uh, the culture wars weirdo, wrote a book called uh, The Soldier in the State. She's a good book. Yes, have you read that? Yeah, I'm going to reread it because you pointed out something that I'd like forgotten, but I read it like, I read it like, oh, it must have been 2002, 2003, um, because I was in a paleo conservative sphere. So reading a lot mm -hmm. of that kind of material and trying to respond to like, why did Samuel Huntington become all like a warmonger? But from that point, from that time period, from a conservative point of view, not from a mm -hmm. Marxist one. Yeah, I, I mean, he has he get the funny thing about Huntington is that he does a lot of scholarship and a lot of work, and then at the end, just kind of forgets everything that he wrote and <laughs> inserts his own biases and conclusions. Um, but he does what I do appreciate about him is that he goes through this whole history of how the state and the like, the liberalization of the state, the opening up of. Uh, away from just aristocrats being like the bureaucracy and the officers and running everything, like the, the minor aristocracy and noblemen, uh, mm -hmm. is that it required uh, liberal education uh, to exist. It, it needed like this um, standards to bring people up to uh, in order for bureaucracy to work in like the bourgeois way it does. Like it, in, and, um, in order to uh, install the ideology of professionalism, which he doesn't consider it to be an, a, an ideology. He kind of takes professionalism as to be a real thing uncritically. Mm -hmm. But since I'm an Althusserian, I'm going to read it as an ideology. Um, and this is like the main function of liberal education. Uh, and it, it's designed to instill this ideology of professionalism in order to get people, well, it, it has several roles, but one of them is to get people to run the state and to create state ideology uh, in the, the most abstract theoretical sense, right? So it's a, it's from the, from the standpoint of, from standpoint of classical Althusserian split, it's part of the, um, the ideological apparatus as opposed to the obvious repressive uh, we're, we're actually we're removing state because it's assumed part of the ideological state apparatus. It's actually both. Yeah, because okay. because it also provides uh, the professionals for the military as well. Right. So it is it is part of it is so we can just say it is actually part of the general state apparatus. On yes. Both sides. Got it. Um, but in this case, these usually aren't the people like the, when we're talking about the PMC and PMC discourse. We're not usually concerned with the military officer corps. Right. Um, no, I actually am like, why don't they talk about all the parts yeah. of the, of the, of the, of the prof? I've also talked about this when I was screaming about how like prof the professionals you're talking about aren't managers. Yeah, like the managers <laughs> are a different people, different group of people. But anyway, I mean, Amber um, Frost will talk about like HR a lot, and she has something there, but I don't know why. Well, I know why. I know why they have to call the class is because they don't actually have anything deeper theoretically to use uh, right just to step amber, back into... amber frost will also claim not to be part of the pmc she yes explicitly in a in a, in a uh, conversation with with catherine lou and i'm like i don't know how you and catherine lou are not part of the pmc given that you are does she still work at nyu but i know she did and no um, 
and she's in a podcast. And um, Catherine Lou is a yeah, in Brooklyn. Well, I guess she's um, in LA now. Oh, but Catherine Lou is at UC Irvine, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a film studies teacher. Yeah. So these are people very integrated into this ideological state apparatus of liberal education mm -hmm. um, and li liberal higher education specifically. Um, and well, I, I like the reason they have to do this, well, just to get back there for a second, is that they don't, they have to, because they don't have any concept of relative autonomy like Althusser does, um, they have to posit a class basically behind every social phenomena, right? Mm. Like, so the, the state, like, which is a very good reason to read Philosophy of the Encounter because he has a brilliant passage in there about uh, the, the failures of Marx when it comes to the state. And um, a, anyway, uh, the, the bigger point is that, um, oh, shit, where was I? What was, was uh, the, the bigger, the, the bigger point with like the, them being involved in like liberal education is that, they have to um like, they're the only people who recognize the pmc right mm -hmm. working class people aren't really familiar with this discourse of it for the most right. part right i mean and, yes and i think that um like if i wanted to put some psychoanalysis into it i, I would say that um because the uh like liberal, the structural role of liberal education isn't just to create the ideology of the present state. It doesn't, it, it's not just pure propaganda. And we have mm -hmm. to ask ourselves why it's not just pure propaganda. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's not is because it, it, if you have like a capitalism where everything is being revolutionized constantly. Uh, you have to create not just the ideology for today, but the ideology for tomorrow. Um, you have to critique what exists in order to make that possible, which is a lot of what liberal like academics do, right? Right. And uh, when you do that, um, you you start to get a little like. If you recognize that fact that like the, the liberal education is serving like this bigger nefarious goal, like what do you do? How, how do you uh, reconcile this like with, with, in the critique? Like you like if you feel that this is um, in, in a situation where there isn't really like a working class uh, movement in the same way that there was like pre-World War II um, and you might start to feel that well it, instead of um, reading into every like uh, cultural phenomenon like punk rock or something revolutionary forever maybe the opposite is the truth that normal people are like the, the real subject here we as academics um are the problem. Right. So you have the inversion of the so your your critique of everyday life becomes the critique of critique of everyday life, which instead of Hegelian y transcending it, um <laughs> uh or put it in whatever framework you like. Um because I'm not actually Hegelian, I'm just being a national here. <laughs> um, um instead of transcending that flits back on itself and and reaffirms everyday life as the revolutionary aspect, right? So, yeah. so it it takes a it's kind of a bad consciousness, unhappy consciousness inversion. And if you see the world as a closed system, because one of the things I'm always amazed at, like all these PMC debates, is how milk toast their answers are. Not just that they're right wing, but like like their conception of what's even at stake on both sides mm -hmm. is incredibly narrow um it's all on the level of like cultural discourse analysis they they never right. escaped it and it's very clear if you read nagel if mm -hmm. and it's this and lou just regurgitates nagel basically um that uh that this is what they're doing that um 
where you said Nagel didn't even Nagel didn't talk about a professional managerial class this way, but yeah, no, she didn't. She didn't have that concept. Uh, she was, I mean, she didn't even really talk about class at all. No, she didn't. Part. Right. She, um, she, she pulls from Peter Church and, um, and Cleo Dynamics now, but mm -hmm. at the time she didn't pull from anyone. And it was like this nebulous working class, but what did she mean by that? You never really knew. Yeah. The working class was like normal people, I guess. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> where, whereas like the PMC discourse, they run up and drug up these articles from the late seventies and early eighties by Barbara Ehrenweich. They were kind of re-drug up in the nineties again, but, but took them for opposite purposes. So before it was like, these are precarious professionals who don't, if you can't fit into this managerial class that James Burnham is describing, are the professionalization theorists describing in general liberal discourse. So since they don't fit in that, they're being precarionized, they might be a subject to team up with the working class as, as a route for the Vanguard class. And Aaron Reich's theory, when I read it charitably, I mean, it, it's still not that coherent, to be honest, mm -hmm. but does make sense when you look at the history of the classes to which both the enemy strata and the leadership strata a Marxism has come from. You look at fa where fascists come from, but also where the leader of the S by Day come from, which were like declass. Like yes, there were workers involved, but a lot of the leaders, especially originally, were declass A, in yeah. all kinds of directions. Yeah, th that's um, the absurdity of this kind of analysis, which kind of leads you to the conclusions that every ideological struggle in like modern history, and maybe even before that, is the PMC fighting among itself. Right. Be because what we're talking about here is what basically Marx called like mental laborers. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is something that I want to talk This Cole mentioned this in the thing about Michael Lind. One of the reasons why you guys don't hear me talk as much shit about Michael Lind as I do the people who claim to be Marxist is that explicitly Michael Lind doesn't. So you can read it more honestly. Um, Michael Lind has a theory of class. His theory of class is, is Burnhamite and Weberian. Right. Um, with, and he'll, he'll tell you it. Like, and he basically thinks that the bourgeois have structurally removed themselves from the game entirely and only occasionally come down to like adjudicate between three classes mm -hmm. and a, an actual managerial elite, a kind of, um, he doesn't call them professional, like he calls them professionals. He doesn't call them a uh, professional managerial class that are adjacent to the state and um, a petite bourgeois that is alienated from the state because they're in areas of low profitability. And I actually think, even though he's not a Marxist, he doesn't claim to be a Marxist, he's a weird nationalist. Like, and I say he's a weird nationalist, he's some kind of like center left to center right, depending on the year, because he's gone back and forth. I mean, he started off in the American Enterprise Institute. Um, uh, like, non Marxist, like, New Dealer who thinks like we need some kind of multicultural corporatism, but that preserves the dominant culture of the United States. Um, and that's his class analysis. And these, a lot of these Marxists pull from him. They pull from Peter Church and they pull from, they pull from rereading Aaron Reich as describing a hostile force um, to deal with the fact that there is, there is this state apparatus stuff and this professionalized stuff as a kind of, internal stratification to different classes now. Um, and I agree with you that like liberal ideology functions as a way to train different sectors of the class and works that way as a kind of distinction mechanism. You also describe like, if you take a more complicated than the binary or, you know, even Marx doesn't have a binary class to you, but he, when, when they talk about it in polemical terms, even historically, they always talk about it in binaries. Right. And, um, like you look at like the communist manifesto li list, the classes that have been in binary opposition and yeah. like, well, I mean, um, this is like, this is the simple, the simplified theory there that, that, and even in its most complicated form, when we're talking about the state, there were problems mm -hmm. because, uh, like in a sophisticated form, Lenin was basically saying that, uh, when class struggle is intensified, um, the state becomes more autonomous. But then, like, what's the logic of the state then when it becomes autonomous, right? What what drives this? What it, it's it's very up in the air. And in, in a sense, it's almost like what um, uh, what do you describe Michael Lind is talking about mm. um, with the 
the bourgeois and hot. Well, I don't know, maybe not quite, but right. But I actually, I tend to be like, this is one of my distinctions from, from classical Leninism is I tend to think that the appearance of the semi-autonomous state emerging from, from intensified class conflict is kind of an illusion. Mm -hmm. Um, I would hate to say it's a real illusion because that, but I, I do actually think like it is a valid misperception, maybe the best way to say it. Yeah. Um, whereas, um, and it may have explained some of the weirdnesses that the Bolsheviks get themselves into, um, like how they have to maintain certain, frankly, bourgeois uh, traits, whether or not you think they're state capitalists, whether or not you buy into any of the Trotskyist or left communist critiques of the Soviet Union, you do have to deal with the fact they maintained a lot more of the bourgeois apparatus than they wanted to themselves. And they're explicit about that. Um, Ooh, that reminds me of something I wanted to, to hit you on, mm -hmm. um, which is like Doug is always saying that uh, like the, the Soviet Union never abolished uh, the the law of value. Uh, I would actually argue that the law of value was never applied in the Soviet Union after um, like the, the Stalinists, uh, after the end of the NEP. Mm. And the Stalin stated it as an aspirational goal that the law of value was something that the Soviet Union aspired to. In, in, in the course of development. So catch up. My, 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 I uh, have a more complicated view than Doug on this. So mm -hmm. if you were to ask, and if you, when I pressed Doug on this, I was like, what element of capitalism do you think is a defining element that makes state capitalism capitalism? And I'll get to how that's related to what you're talking about. Because I actually agree that internal to itself, from the end of the NEP through about the 1970s, um, there was no law of value functioning within the Soviet Union. However, um, because there was nothing functioning within the Soviet Union consistently, um, I actually think Khalil Tikhtin's right. There is no dominant form internal to the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union still exists, operates, and works within, after the 1940s, the international circuit of capital. You do not have international loans from capitalist countries and as a state and not function within the greater law of value. So what you have is a is like this weird area where there is where it can't emerge, like no new system can emerge because in my reading of this, um, and you know, um one of the reasons why Stalin wanted the law of value reinstated in the Soviet Union is because they couldn't figure out what else to do, and they were hesitant to, to implement any of like the the technic schemes, which led to um, cybernetics or any of that stuff. Um, and and they also still had to function to not starve within the larger capitalist system, which led to weirdnesses like the three ruble pe peggings. There's three different rubles, mm -hmm. like. Um, no capitalist economy, as I, I, I told the Doug Lane, would ever have that. That doesn't make sense. But if you're trying to maintain uh, a, a kind of an impossibility, an actual contradiction, uh, you know, you might call it like um, of a non-capitalist society functioning completely within a capitalist circuit and dependent upon it. Um, you have to get increasingly incoherent and it would also make planning damn near impossible. So um, that, you know, like for two reasons, one, you have no consistent input internally to like, to really adjudicate things is what you're going to do. Trust the managers. They have every incentive to lie. Um, particularly in the periods where you'll shoot them if they, if they like, and then um you have this pressure externally to be incoherent too, because you still have to focus, function, focus and compete, not just militarily, not just as an ideology in the broad liberal sense of that term, not to confuse people, um, <laughs> but also, but also literally in the market um, internationally. Well, I, I would think, I think the, the emphasis there on the market is perhaps a bit too high. I think like 
the competition was Rio in a national sense. I mean, it's not like they like, there was international trade, but nothing on the level of like that we see now in like China and Vietnam. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, this is this is one of the weirdnesses where you have people call like even Malice calling the USSR state capitalist, and yet somehow China isn't. Yeah. Um. It's like what? Um. But but you gotta I mean, you gotta anything, give China's the not state capitalist enough. Um. <laughs> Because yeah, they, they failed it, they messed it up with because they tried to decentralize industry. Um, and you know, if they actually had, they could have actually pulled off that, um, like the well, that letter that Marx writes about, um, like how the communist system in Russia could have been the basis for communism. Yeah, skipping China could have done. China actually accomplished that for like two years or something, and then the the Great Leap Forward kind of blew it up. Well, yeah, uh, trying to do mass industrial production decentralized. Is insane. Yeah, um, like it, it, um, it was. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, I think one thing, a couple of things that I think that people would would know about our differences is, uh, I am more. I think you are more in the bureaucratic friendly, and I'm gonna use bureaucratic friendly politely. Um, uh, I think I told you in a private tweet that I'm not sure if we're going to be friends or if one day in the Great Revolution I have to be the person that puts you against the wall. Um, but uh, there'll be a, a line long in front of you for that. <laughs> um, I might put them against the wall too, uh, <laughs> so I get it first. No, um, I, um, but uh, that I come from the the part of Marxism that takes the platformist tradition seriously. That the state, um, the nature of the state is part of the problem inherently. Um, but I also take the Marxist critique that you can't just abolish it without, like, I don't know, killing millions of people, um, like by neglect, if nothing else, um, very seriously. Well, um, I think that we have to be careful, like when we identify bureaucracy explicitly with the state. Um, mm. Because I'm an accountant in a private firm, I am effectively a bureaucrat, though, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that I think that's a, a general. I mean, you go back like bureaucracy is literally bureaucracy the oldest is not... profession, even older than prostitutes. Uh, All right, um, um, I would say, I would say. The oldest profession is probably soldier, then then maybe bureaucrat, and then maybe prostitute. But um <laughs> like, maybe. Um what I would say um is that uh a lot of the incoherence on the state and and the Altusarian tradition, which I think I think is interesting because Altusare in some ways sounds like an anarchist because his weird French absolutism actually inverts on itself. Um, you should but, see this interview that he, I think it's the only interview we have of him on like TV on camera. Mm -hmm. And he's saying like Marx went too hard on, uh, on, on Bakunin mm -hmm. in the first international. Uh, and like the way he talks about actually existing communism is that he's basically describing what Stirner called a union of egoists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It, it's hilarious because if you look if you look at the Maoist tradition, for example, and someone's bringing this up in chat, but I, I have studied this. Mao's first exposure to socialism, um, if you read uh, the Russian biography of him, which is critical but sympathetic, it's written from the Soviet archive knowledge too. Um, I gotta remember the the guy who wrote it. It's just called Mao, a critical life or something. Um, it's it goes into Mao's Mao's exposure to ideology is as follows. Nietzsche, weirdly, um, <laughs> Nietzsche, Kropotkin, because it was more readily available in um, in um, um, in the Soviet Union. Left oppositionist. Um, some calls this. Some people call this guy his major uh, influence in Marxism a uh, uh, Trotskyist, but it's too early for Trotskyism to be separated from like the left wing of Bolshevism. Um, then Stalin, then Lenin, then Marx, then Hegel, throw in Chinese <laughs> legalism and uh, maybe a pinch of Taoism to appeal to peasants. 
and you start understanding M Mao's intellectual development, um, which is very different from the experience, like the experience. And also like Mao's genius in my mind is mostly in military tactics, actually like the smarter, the smarter Chinese communists are probably not Mao, but um, this tension in him between a state absolutism and an absolute hostility to anything that looks like bureaucracy in the state yeah. seems to come out of the fact that peasant anarchism, both as an indigenous tradition to China and coming from the Kropotkin influence from Russia, which was China, translated into Chinese earlier than Marxist texts were, um, are highly inflecting Mao's communism and the coalition he's trying to build in the, C, uh, in, the, in, the in the CCP. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, there's, there, there's interesting because the Bakutinism that you're talking about and, and that, that, um, I'll just say I might want to defend partly comes out of like f the French relationship to the state and French absolutism is particular. Like when you look at like the different answers to modernity, French absolutism is their attempt to that. It's like, we're just, and this, you see this even in the philosophs, they're like, um, we want everybody to be free, but it's going to take too long to get them caught up. If you just educate the king and make the state all pack off over there, do it. I mean, that's kind of their the philosophs' plan is basically like uh, enlightened despotism. I don't know. It's going to take too long to educate everybody to do this immediately. Um. So, are you back? Yes, I'm back. All right. Sorry. Um, Wi-Fi just went out. It happens. Um, so, um, is it, do you also think that maybe that there's a double, there's a double Rammy there. So there's like this kind of anarchist strain coming in from Maoism that I don't even think like, that's the part of Maoism I a little bit like, but also think is a major problem with it. Like, it's like, that's my ambivalence about Maoism itself comes from that. Um, and then there's this reaction to the French state, which has an absolutist tradition, which I think is still reflected in kind of the even the cc uh the the french communist party's like a relationship to the liberal administrative state um, well i wouldn't underestimate the extent to which althusser was really opposed to like stalinism in like the in the party uh with so this is one one thing i the great debate about althusser that i'm really fascinated and i'm never sure on was he a stalinist or was he a Stalinist, anti-Stalinist, or was he an anti-Stalinist? I sometimes think, sometimes I think one, and sometimes I think two. And I know two is a contradiction, but it seems to be most likely the truth. Well, I mean, like the with the, at least from my understanding of it, I'm not a, a historian of like the uh, of the left in the same way that you are. Um, but I'm a poet by a profession. But go yes, ahead. I, I've written <laughs> poetry. It's very bad. Um, but uh, I, and I've actually you're a political an, scientist. I would kick us both out of the republic. Well, I, I've actually I, I would love to be a novelist first. I have one novel I self-published, and nobody reads it because it's bad. Um, but uh, to answer your question, I, I think right. that because of the the sway that like the, the importance of the Soviet Union at the time, mm -hmm. that uh, he, he had to present himself as more orthodox than the orthodoxy coming out of um, the Soviet Union, basically. So can I ask you my my uh, heuristic of of charitable suspicion, which is sounds okay. like a contradiction. I'm, I'm liking sounding like a contradiction today. Um, do you think a lot of the couching of science in the particularly weird way that that uh, that I'm critiquing Althusser for in the beginning um, is trying to get out from under the way that Stalinism uh, aligned itself with a kind of kind of Newtonian, but also like really structural Hegelian. I know I know people think that's weird, but I'm 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 saying that as opposed to the phenomenology. So you're focusing on the science of logic as opposed to the phenomenology here. Um, that Alter Sayer is really trying to get out of that. And couching it to stay somewhat copacetic and somewhat like a loyal opposition as opposed to disloyal opposition to the French Communist Party as a critique of a philosophy of science, where it's actually like a total critique of actually existing Marxist Leninism in France and maybe even in the Soviet Union. Well, I think he's trying 
Well, I think it's twofold. I, I think he is trying to, um, like, provide a, like, I think his project is to save the science, uh, the, the immortal science, basically, of Marxism. Uh -oh. uh, and uh, that the, the, the Soviet reputation, like, the, the, the Soviets did real damage to it, that Stalin did real damage to it um, in the West. And uh, and I think he probably obviously disagreed with the, the like the uh, very like Newtonian deterministic interpretation of it um, that seemed to cause a lot of theoretical problems, but also uh, I, to the extent we can say that it determined action uh, pro caused problems there as well. Um, but I mean, like it. It, the fact that I, I think this is implicit in his focus on state ideological apparatuses mm -hmm. is that everything that's coming out of the Soviet Union is coming from a state ideological apparatus, mm -hmm. and you can't really trust it, you know. I see. So yeah. So interesting. I, I think that's interesting. I will. In my I, I know my uh, my uh, emancipation friends are now saying that I should be subject to a struggle session and rustificated. Um, but, um, um, but, uh, I, I also, you know, oh, and now they're calling for me to be put into a streaming gulag and made to play smash ultimate guys, <laughs> this is not okay. Um, <laughs> but what I will say to, 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 I'm being charitable right now and expecting about two or three weeks, I'm going to find an appropriate anti altisarian bet nar for you to to empower and make stronger but um i do think that there is there is a nuance to to the way we should approach altasir even if we disagree with him um why is everyone dragging newton because newtonian determinism uh has a it's really stupid. That's, well it's not stupid but i, like, I, I mean it, it it's so out, outdated from like the present theoretical like where we are and what we have to do theoretically like it, it, it answers a totally different set of questions than what we're what we're trying to answer right so um what i would say oh god um i just got derailed by my own stream um what i would say to you is <laughs> that um I find Altusser symptomatic himself, um, and maybe oh, yeah. you do too. What his, what his Catholicism, especially? <laughs> I was about to say, in my case, I am I'm a bad Catholic as well, so I I sympathize. Yes, yeah, so yeah, it's it, it's, but it's bread Catholicism, not spaghetti Catholicism, um, um, and I guess. Yours would be tortilla Catholicism. I don't know why the way the food makes <laughs> makes a difference, but it somehow it does. Because I don't have other good separations of Catholics. I just know them by their main source of carbohydrates. Um, I mean, that, that's honestly the main. That's just, that should be the only real determination in society. Honestly, like the what only is, what is your primary carbohydrate? <laughs> yeah, that is the only material aspect of culture, after all. Really, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're all so bread tube is really French. No, I'm kidding. Um, baguette tube, <laughs> baguette tube, croissant tube. But croissants are Hungarian, right? No, they're Austrian. Um, so uh, no, what derailed me, my friend, is someone said that the appropriate punishment would make me play Among Us with AOC and random <laughs> bread tubers, which that that does stab me in the heart, Grimlock. That's that's evil and wrong. Um, but uh. But yes, there's a lot. I think I think what we would what we might differ in is in the emphasis because one thing that uh, Esri, who dislikes Altusser even more than me, um, I know it's 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 almost it's almost stunning. Um, is Esri also says that 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 you know the Hegelian problem that kind of came to an impasse in the 1930s. I think in my mind, you know, in Lukash and all that, leads you to a bunch of answers to which Altusser is one of. Like, um, 
I think analytical Marxism, which has a whole lot of problems, a whole lot of problems with, with assuming things they shouldn't assume is another one. Um, and I think political Marxism, um, by that, yeah, I mean, I will, the Brenner school of thought is another one. Um, yeah, I will say this of analytical Marxism. It's good as an ideology, bad as a science. <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. Um, what I will say in, def in mild defense of, of, of Perelowski, the specific analytical Marxist who's kind of a traitor um, and an anti-communist. And so like, we should keep that in mind at all times. But um, is that I do think if you started applying game theory to any framework of Marxism, frankly, um, even though with the realization that game theory is kind of a bourgeois construction, and also that most games aren't zero sum, you can explain a whole lot of what people actually do a lot better than just like okay, take 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 uh take game theory plus alterstary and ideological critique, just for example. Okay. I think you could use that to yeah. predict how people are gonna counter signal and what weird political alliance cul-de-sacs they're gonna get into. So like are are the DSAers gonna become Democrats? Are the it, as a broad tendency, not as not all of them. I know, I know. We don't want to get into that. Um, are are the DSAers who are post leftists going to all become Tucker Carlson Republicans? Um, are worse. Um, if you game theory that out, you you would go not all of them, but there's going to be a strong tendency to cut both ways because at the top of the political spectrum in the United States, it seems like a closed ideological system to which you can only make allegiance. And that 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 also leads to what you were talking about in your structural analysis of the PMC debates, is that if you take the PMC at their own word, everything looks like it's a debate within the PMC forever going back forever. Yeah. And, and and someone like Peter Tertian, who doesn't use the phrase PMC, but he talks about general elites. That's literally his theory. Like you know, I think this is an important um, point to make with regards to uh, like the way that Althusser gets out of overly simplistic determinism. Mm -hmm. And his aleatory turn um, is that, like, how, how do we get out of this situation where structurally we have the two parties and there doesn't seem to be a way out? Mm -hmm. Right? A nuke. And, but, sorry? I said a nuke, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the Posadist <laughs> option. No, <laughs> it, it, it could work. Yeah. I, I think that... Uh, Nuclear armed dolphins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think the, this Althusser solution here is that, like, what we require is a historical encounter, um, and that, like, the the there, and we see that there are, like, the the two party system isn't a perfect, a perfect uh, ideological like system of legitimation. We we've seen cracks in it, even this past uh, in twenty twenty mm -hmm. uh, with the riots and everything. I mean, I've written a little bit about. Uh, how like the uh, the police have done a lot to, to undermine state legitimacy in the U.S. Um, probably more than uh, even Congress, um, although they've done quite a bit. Uh, and like I mean, I guess we are seeing an, a historical encounter right now with perhaps the end of neoliberalism with Biden. Um, well, I, I think it was, I, the, the more important point here is to talk about. What what uh, what role does the encounter play in Althusser's structuralism, which is uh, that it, it it serves as this jumping off point where um, like you you can't draw a conclusion about what the like what comes next, right? What when you have an encounter, um, like the the, the one specific encounter will have its own internal logic, which will not be determined by the logic of whatever led up to it. Okay. Which is so, why dialectic yeah. doesn't work. Which is the same critique that Badu makes about the event in eventual politics. And that also comes up in my other nemesis, who I will not name, um, who also happens to be French and dead. Um... We talked about him earlier. Ah. Um, 
is the the whole the whole the event the eventual politics horizon. But you know, I'm just gonna point out by way of intellectual genealogy, there's some weird Heideggerianism in there. Um, just you know, gonna gonna point that out. I'm just gonna let it be. I'm not gonna like argue about it. Um, well, you know what's uh, funny. When I was reading um, the philosophy encounter, I was very frustrated uh, mm -hmm. because of well, I mean, you know, Althusser loves Spinoza so much. Oh uh, yeah, and uh, he does, and also in a way that's weird. Um, go yeah. ahead. Well, it's it's a funny part is that one of the things that's tacked on to the philosophy encounter is this interview that he does, uh, mm -hmm. the script of it, and he say, and somebody asks him about like radical nominalism. And the way he talks about it as like a proto materialism, and I'm thinking with the way that he like he probably could have used sterner better than like uh, than um, who are we talking about the uh, the guy I just mentioned Spinoza oh, Spinoza yeah 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 well I mean I think also like. I, I will like. I'm a big fan about, of Sterner. Is, yeah, yeah, is my I've problem. Noticed. Um, what I will say that has come up a lot in this that that maybe we're both doing a little bit is contextualizing um, yeah. Althusser. Um, and what I would say about Althusser, I don't think you can remove him from the French Academy of the 1950s and like and like their particular research concerns, even when reading him in terms of the debates within you know communism, which is separate from that actually. Um, but, you know, he's probably reaching for what would have been immediately available. Just like, you know, when I, like, if I'm a British, I don't know, if I'm some Canadian, uh, you know, socialist who's trying to justify stuff and keep some kind of Marxism, I'm going to reach for, uh, I don't know, Sur you know, like, um, uh, Searles or something or, um, or like, Bertrand Russell, and then go back and do Marx. Um, so, you know, and Marx reaches for Hegel and Epicurus and Aristotle, I mean, as well as Adam Smith and Ricardo and pissing on Perhune and um, et cetera. I mean, so we can't remove ourselves from those contexts. I mean, um, uh, at the same time, though, like, is to, I mean, uh, perhaps my education was particularly scattershot. Uh, but is there even a canon anymore? No. Um, what I think the question is: Was there ever a canon? And the question is: and My answer to that is only in certain fields and at certain time periods for about a few years at a time. And um, uh, so, um, so no, there isn't a canon. And in so much there is a canon now, all two say are taught poorly. Um, is is in that canon. Um, and, you know, um, you have made some case that we should at least take our, our um, let's say, a political science 102 understanding of Althusser and uh, not, uh, and not, and also our understanding of like, was he a Maoist or not? How, how Stalinist is Maoism? Is there such a thing as Maoism before 1984? Um, which is, I know people laugh. That's a real contention. Um, Jay, I can't say his last name. Paul contends that there, modern Maoism, as we we know it, only begins in the 80s. I can honestly say I don't want to know the answer. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I I would say that to some degree, like the, I I actually take a nominalist position on this. Like we're not talking about the same thing all the time. Here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know if it's meaningful to talk about it that way. Um, so, um, and that said, I'm going to let you, I, I'm going to close off so we can both go about our evenings and relative peace and you don't have to leave me baiting and switching you all the time in this Mont Bailey of a debate, non-debate that we have here. Um, I will, I, I want you to close off. If you were going to suggest three short pieces Three, um, by Althusser that you are going to tell everyone if they love him or hate him 
read this and read it closely, read it twice. Um, what three works would you pick? And they need to be short. Yeah, I guess, uh, well, the first one would be the ideology and state ideological apparatuses essay. So you agree with the, with the, with, with my, uh, with my critical, my, uh, my critical approaches to literature, uh, advisor from 2004. Okay. Check. Yes. You need, right. I mean, you need it in there. You shouldn't stop there. Uh, but it's a good starting point. Should you teach it without teaching any other Marxist critical theory first? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, yeah, okay. you, you need to know. I, I, th I think you even need to understand a little bit, like, of Srafa or like, like classical political economy to really get it. Okay. Um, but uh, okay. So suboptimal. Read it by itself. Optimal. Read it itself with a bunch of context that you would yes. select in a syllabus. Okay. Second piece. Uh, the Marx and its limits, uh, Marx, Marxism and its limits section of philosophy of the encounter. Okay, which I have not read. So, brief summary: Why is that important? That's important because it it, it provides the whole basis for understanding uh, the most detailed uh, system of like why the state doesn't always just act in the bourgeoisie's interests. It gives us a more systematic understanding of the state uh, than I think anywhere else does. Okay, so Marxism and Business Limits from Philosophy of the Encounter. Read that because it it'll explain why both the state as class independent and the state as just it's just the what is it the 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 ruling committee of the bourgeoisie um, are both too simple of an understanding of what is going on yes. with the state. Okay. And your third and final. Um, I'd probably go with, uh, but hmm, I'm torn. Uh, from a, like a systematic understanding, I'd probably go with the first chapter of Reading Capital by Alpha Zare. Okay, first chapter of Reading Capital, but you would also say don't read the rest of it till you've read a lot of the Oxford Zare. Well, I would I would say that. I don't use reading capital as a, as a secondary source for capital. Read it to understand Althusser. Okay. That's because you and I agree when we were like, I think we were talking about like, if you were going to read a secondary source and I was like, list a bunch of ones that oppose each other. I would and I say, was like, oh. yeah, yeah. I would say don't read secondary sources. That's my opinion. <laughs> I would say definitely don't read them first because whatever your first secondary source is, that's how you're going to interpret capital. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, um, I, I do think reckoning with secondary sources is, is useful. Um, I mean, maybe we disagree with that, but I would say there's some, some of the most popular secondary sources in grad school are the ones that I think are the wildest, which is, for example, reading capital by Altrasair are even worse, the whole of them with Francier, Balabar and everybody in it. Um, cause I'm like, I don't even know what that's about. Um, on another one I would say would be bad would be like Jamison's interpretation of capital, which is a literary interpretation. Um, and then dear God, don't start with David Harvey. Oh like, yeah. They, that's what I got when I was, if they, they told me to, uh, read when, when they assigned, uh, capital, I just didn't open it. Right. Uh, <laughs> I yeah, haven't. Yeah, I mean, like, he's a guy who tries to talk about capital while just throwing out value theory at all together. And I'm like, yeah. how, how do you do, you do that? that? <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, I'm going to talk about origin of the species, but I don't believe in evolution. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, okay. <laughs> it's almost like, would. <laughs> it's almost like um, you're trying to will Thomas Piketty's <laughs> capital into existence instead, you know? Yeah, it is kind of like that. It's like, let's, let's, See if we can create the Keynesian Marxo hybrid that does not. Um, okay, um, which Althusserian would you read in what book by them? Um, if you were given someone re reading on this, uh, <laughs> I would I would probably actually recommend. Um, Well, I will say that there isn't really 
that I've read so far, like a, a really good, solid successor to Althazer. I think that I like Palancis, I like Wolf when he's talking about Althazer um, in Containing Economic Theories, which is a good book. And Palancis's book, uh, State in Class Power, I think is what it's called, is pretty good. But none of them is as like impactful as anything Althazer writes. Yeah, I would, I would myself say, uh, if I was going to tell you to read an officer, and I read Wolf and Wes next, um, uh, what is it, class and, yeah, class theory and history, which is the, which I think is the most defensible, and it's weirdly Althusserian, um, state capitalist theory. Um, as far as like being objective and also being somewhat theoretically consistent and rigorous, um, I don't agree with it. I actually, my, my own theory is more in line with Hillel Tickton. Um, um, how did all the, how did all these literature props become the standard bearers for Marxism? Because the only, uh, I'll answer this real fast as we're talking about this. Um, because the only places where Marxism was not completely delegitimized in the American Academy was critical theory, which got moved into literature, um, even though that's not originally where it was. Uh, it was originally like in sociology and in historiography, where, where even conservatives recognize Marx's historiography and of a, a, a various varieties, both classical, structural, etc., as legitimate historiographical frameworks. Like you can talk to conservative historiographers and they take Marx's historiography seriously. But I think um, this is also a part of like how literature gets taught in colleges, which is you just get taught like you, here's all these interpretations you can choose. Choose your best flavor and go with that. That's to lose its fault. <laughs> um, yeah, he, I, I, his influence on Academy was bad, but I respect <laughs> him as an author. I respect Foucault <laughs> as an author as well, although his influence was bad as well. I was about to say, like, I've always find it amusing that when you like, this will be my last observation to to back you up on this, um, that that all the Deleuzians somehow ended up being like radical liberals because I'm like, you guys seem to have read Structure of the Clinic or his critique of the Panopticon and just decided that, well, maybe we could use this as a model for how to build the Panopticon, <laughs> um, like, like. Well, what? I mean, uh, I, I mean, I think that's the problem when you get rid of the teleological end goal. It it's also gets rid of any kind of politics it might have, you know. Yeah, if you get the land at best, are you know, as like non-political delusion, are all of uh, all of uh, literature writing influenced by Foucault um, from, uh, you know. Um, from the from the fact that everybody in critical race theory throws the terms bodies around weird in a weird way that only makes sense if you realize that they're like crypto referencing um, Foucault's biopolitics. Um, oh yeah, um, I, I took a literature class and we were reading um, what is it like uh, Passing by Nella Larson? I'm pretty sure somebody brought that up and it was weird. Um, yep. and, uh, then people misappropriating, um, Edward Said for strange things is also probably Foucault's fault. Um, but, uh, now we're, now we're into the internal politics of boring humanities, uh, prof stuff that I preferred not to think about since I deliberately left that world. We're doing um, the state ideological apparatus, apparatus's job for them. Right. And, and, and by the way. This is basically what all PMC debates really are about. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, it's like, who, which bully picked on you when you were in graduate school the most? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a replication of your kindergarten trauma, really. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's been an interesting conversation. I hope people got out of it. Your recommendations, um, I think, are great. I'm actually going to go read that essay i wanted to read it before today um thank uh uh nico you're gonna get a kick out of the fact you've had the most consistent watchers of any of my live streams so far with another person um wow. i'm glad um, i kept things lively yeah um we've been averaging for the last hour over 30 which is 
I've had people with more, but usually we go so long that like it's like mostly about five, and there's like 20 minutes where there's 30 people watching. So people have been watching now for um, fairly consistently. Um, I would like to thank our uh, people, uh, Mason, who I know, um, Erica, who was on here last week and will be on again, um, Grimlock, who is my uh, uh, my Iron Felix. Um, uh, political pain. I don't know who you are, but you're funny. Um, I hope you also enjoy Potato Tube. Um, Martin Lennon King, um, you're also funny. Um, uh, Andre, nice to meet you. Kil uh, Kilgore Kraut, you amuse me. Mutual Eye, I know who you are. Thank you for being here. And uh, Cole, um, I don't know who you are, but you really, you, you got a lot of my weird uh, posts left. Uh, of you know scholarly background obsessions going on um nico uh i'm not gonna say when because like i have a regular a bunch of regular guests but you'll come back on here again either to defend the dsa or defend to lose i think you're gonna be my favorite uh loyal opposition on farm blog um other with with uh erica being my uh favorite disloyal historical friend um and uh we'll like to see where that goes um and um and uh uh thank you guys i hope you enjoyed it uh nico where can they find your stuff oh, we got yeah like i took your time so i might as well plug it. <laughs> yeah i got a twitter uh, at nicholas d villa v-i-l-l-a-r one um and i got a sub stack and a blog you can get from there um and if you want you can even find my fiction writing on my blog. Uh, I have a screenplay and a novel on there. Um, right. What's oh, your and, screenplay called? Since you already shat on your own novel, so we can yeah, I love that. the I love the screenplay. It's called the uh, okay. Vitreous. It's a uh, but uh, you can find my nonfiction, my more serious nonfiction writing at Palladium Magazine, uh, where uh, I usually I consistently put out theory stuff. I actually will say that uh, I read your Palladium stuff and liked it, even though you were an Altrasarian. And uh, that was why I'm talking to you right now. And um, <laughs> um, because when you told me you were that much of an Altasarian, I was actually a little bit like, what's wrong with my judgment? I thought he was cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so, um, so I'm glad you came on and I, I actually got a kick out of this and it seems like our, our, uh, our streamers did as well. Um, so, mm -hmm. Um, feel free to come back. Check out your Substack. Check out your Palladium Magazine work. Palladium, you're doing interesting work there. I think you're maybe the only Marxist that writes a lot there. I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only one. Yeah, but um, it's it's good work. Um, you guys know where to find me. Emancipation Network, Mortal Science, you know, the enemy of the immortal science. Um, uh, uh, zero books, Pop of the Left, Barn Blog, Former People, uh, my day job, which I'm not going to mention. You can find me somewhere. Um, and uh, you can find me here. Um, on Wednesdays, I will be streaming with an interview. And I might even one day cut them into sound chunks and re release them onto the internet with no editing because I hate you. Um, and because any entertainment value is purely coincidental. Um, and... Uh, um, that will be my m misanthropy towards the world aimed out uh, into space. And I'm going to quit rambling. Um, oh, this is a new person. Uh, Fado remains. Um, so if, uh, thank you for coming on. Um, Wednesdays in the afternoon, they change depending on the person's schedule. There'll be one of these on most Wednesdays. Um, and Nico will be back probably in a couple months. So... Um, well, I mean, unless, unless Nico is secretly like resenting all the jokes I did at their expense in the beginning of this episode. No, I'd love um, to be back. Um, um, so, uh, Nico, we'll be back and, uh, maybe we'll talk something more immediately applied. Um, and I want to tell everyone, um, Nico's awesome. Even if he is an autistarian. He's, he's one of the few people I would trust to come up here and defend this. Um, and even though he should have to self-critique after this 
and wash himself of his his uh, his bureaucratic ways um, and repent. Um, we still love him, and we're gonna end on that because. <laughs> All right, I am 